This is a revision video about the GCSE chemistry topic of ionic bonding, specifically looking at how ionic bonds form. If you're after something a little bit more advanced, there's a similar video in the A-level chemistry playlist, or if you're brand new to bonding, you might want to watch the introduction to bonding video first. By the end of this video, you should be able to define what we mean by an ion, identify substances that form ionic bonds, describe how non-metal atoms form ions, describe how metal atoms form ions, and finally complete extended response questions in which you describe how a particular metal bonds with a non-metal. In this video, we're not going to look at ionic formulae, although I do have a video about that, and we're not going to look at the properties of ionic compounds, which also gets its own separate video. Atoms are the smallest part of an element that can exist. They're made up of three types of subatomic particle, positive protons, negative electrons, and neutral neutrons. As you can see from this picture of a lithium atom, there are three positive protons, shown by the red circles, three negative electrons, shown by the crosses, and three neutral neutrons, shown by the green circles. There are the same number of positive protons and negative electrons. Because the charges on protons and electrons are the same size, but opposite polarity, they can cancel each other out. So because there are three positive protons and three negative electrons, overall, the atom has no charge. We say it's neutral. As soon as that atom starts to bond, it will gain or lose electrons. And therefore, the number of protons and electrons is no longer balanced. And instead of being neutral, the atom will become charged. And this is what we call an ion. Ions are charged particles that are made when a neutral atom gains or loses electrons and stops being neutral. Because electrons are negative, if an atom gains more electrons, it becomes negatively charged, and if it loses electrons, it becomes positively charged. You should also be aware that no single atom turns into an ion just on its own. The electrons it's gaining or losing have to come from somewhere, so the formation of an ionic bond is always going to involve two atoms. Let's start by looking at non-metals. Here we have a fluorine atom. I can see from the periodic table square that fluorine has an atomic number of nine, which means that it has nine positive protons in its nucleus. And because it's an atom, that also means it has nine negative electrons in the shells around the nucleus. Now, as we said in the introductory video, atoms form bonds in order to become more stable. And the easiest way to become more stable is to have a full outer shell. With the exception of the first shell, we're going to put eight electrons into a shell before we move on to the next one. So here, as you can see, fluorine currently has seven electrons in its outer shell, which is what we would expect because it's in group seven. And the group number tells us how many electrons there are in the outer shell. So in order for that second shell to be full, it needs to gain one electron. We're going to draw this as a dot rather than a cross, just to show that it's come from a different atom. But if you drew a cross, that will be fine. They're all just electrons. Now that electron that we've just added has a single negative charge. And this means that instead of having an uncharged atom, we now have a charged particle that we call an ion. To show that that negative charge is spread all over the ion, we surround it with square brackets and we put a little minus sign to show the negative charge. If we look at oxygen, we can see that being in group six, rather than having seven electrons in its outer shell like fluorine, it only has six electrons. And so to gain a full outer shell, it needs to gain two electrons. Each one of those electrons has a single negative charge. So this ion now has twice as much negative charge as the fluoride ion that we made previously. Again, we draw square brackets and then we write two minus to show that it has twice as much negative charge. If we look at chlorine and sulfur, although they're larger atoms, they're from group seven and group six as well. So they follow the same pattern as fluorine and oxygen. Chlorine has seven electrons in its outer shell, and so it becomes stable by gaining one electron, and we show that it has a single negative charge, and then sulphur is in group six like oxygen, so again, it needs to gain two electrons to have a full outer shell, and then we put our square brackets and a two minus sign to show the charge. 
This is how all non-metals form ions. They gain electrons and therefore they become negatively charged. Metals are on the opposite side of the periodic table. So it probably won't surprise you to hear that they make ions in the opposite way. They lose electrons rather than gaining them. If you look at my picture of a lithium atom, this probably makes sense. In order for that second shell to be filled up, it would need to gain seven electrons. But we could just lose that second shell completely by removing one electron. Remember, these shells, these circles that we draw, aren't physical things that you can touch. They're like the orbits of a planet. We just put a line to show where we're likely to find the electrons. So rather than gaining seven electrons, lithium loses one. And again, we add those square brackets. Now, because we've taken something negative away, the lithium ion has a positive charge. You could also think of it in terms of the lithium atom still having three positive protons in its nucleus, but it now only has two negative electrons in its shells. So there's one proton that isn't balanced out, it isn't cancelled out, and so the overall ion has a single positive charge. Here are three more examples. In each case, the metal atom is going to lose electrons until its outer shell doesn't have any left at all. And so basically it's going to lose one shell and just go down to the next biggest shell, which is already full. So if we look at this beryllium atom, you can see it has two electrons in its outer shell because it comes from group two and it loses both of them. So when that happens, it has a two plus charge because it now has four protons in its nucleus, which we can tell because the atomic number is four, but it only has two electrons left. So there are two positive charges that aren't cancelled out. Sodium is also in group one, so it reacts exactly like lithium. It loses that one outer shell electron to make an iron with a single positive charge. And then magnesium is also in group two, so it also has two electrons in its outer shell and it will lose both of them. So what we're left behind with is the first and second shells only, and that second shell already has eight electrons, it's already full. And again, we have a two plus charge. If we look back at the periodic table, what we can see is that we can actually make predictions about the type of ion that a particular element will make. So as we've just seen, elements from group one always make ions with a single positive charge and elements from group two always make ions with a two plus charge. And likewise for group six and group seven, we see that elements from group six like oxygen and sulfur make ions with a two minus charge and elements from group seven make ions with a single minus charge. And so what I tend to tell people is that when they go into their chemistry exam, the first thing they do before they even look at the questions is think to themselves, I'm feeling really positive, I'm feeling really well prepared. So in the top left of my periodic table, I'm going to write a plus sign. And once you've done that, you just fill in the rest of this, and that's going to help you in the exam if you feel slightly swamped and you forget which way around the charges go. Probably the trickiest kind of exam question about ionic bonding is an extended response question, which for four or five marks asks us to explain how two elements bond together. If we're lucky, they might tell us that they ionically bond, but even if the exam doesn't tell us that, you can figure it out by looking at your periodic table and identifying that you've been given a metal and a non-metal. As we've already said, ions don't form in isolation. A lithium atom can't just make an ion, and a fluorine atom can't just make an ion. What needs to happen is that a metal atom gives one or more electrons to a non-metal atom. So here, as you can see, we have our lithium atom with its electrons represented as dots, and our fluorine atom with its electrons represented as crosses. They're all just the same kind of electrons, it just helps us to keep tabs of which electrons have come from which element. So. In order for it to gain a full outer shell, the lithium atom is going to donate one electron to the fluorine atom. It's going to give one electron because that is the number that it needs in order for its outer shell to be full. And likewise, the fluorine atom is going to receive one electron because it's one short of a full outer shell. So the electron moves from lithium to fluorine and this forms a negative fluoride ion because this fluorine atom has now gained an extra electron, so an extra bit of negativity, and we show that with the square brackets. And then the lithium 
atom that's left behind now has one more proton than it does electrons and so it's positively charged and actually it's not an atom anymore it's now an ion with a single positive charge so to answer this question i would say that the lithium atom loses an electron and this makes an li plus ion and the fluorine atom gains an electron to make an f minus ion now, as a little bit of an exam tip, I would always give the symbols of the elements when describing the ions rather than writing out their names. And the reason for that is that there's no such thing as a fluorine ion. And if you write a fluorine ion, then you're not going to get the mark. It needs to be a fluoride ion. And if you can remember that, then great. But if you've written the symbol for the element, nobody knows whether you're saying fluorine in your head so by writing the symbol instead of the word, you stop yourself from accidentally losing a mark because you made a silly mistake. Here's a similar example. We're looking at how beryllium from group 2 bonds with oxygen from group 6. Being in group 2, beryllium has two electrons on its outer shell and it needs to lose both of them. So each one of those is donated to the oxygen atom. This forms an oxide ion which has a two minus charge because each of those electrons had a single negative charge. And the beryllium that's left over is now an ion with a two plus charge. So I would say that the beryllium atom loses two electrons and makes a Be2 plus ion, and the oxygen atom gains two electrons and makes an O2 minus ion. And again, I would write O2 minus rather than writing oxide, just to make sure that you don't accidentally write an oxygen ion, because an oxygen ion is not a thing and is not going to get you a mark in the exam. Sometimes you have a question where the number of electrons that an atom needs to gain and the number of electrons that an atom needs to lose don't quite tally up. So when lithium bonds with oxygen, a lithium atom can only lose one electron, but the oxygen atom needs to gain two. So the solution here is that we have two lithium atoms, each losing one electron. So the oxide ion still has a two minus charge because it's gained two electrons, one from each lithium atom, and the lithium ions both still have a single positive charge. So to answer this question, I would say that two lithium atoms each lose one electron, and this makes two Li plus ions, and an oxygen atom gains two electrons to make an O2 minus ion. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you found that a useful summary of how ionic bonds form. There are other videos in this series that look at how you can work out the formula for an ionic compound, what the properties of ionic compounds tend to be, and also looking at other kinds of bonding like covalent bonding and metallic bonding. If you did find it useful then don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCSE chemistry videos coming soon.